This week's guest is Kit Prendergast. Kit is a native bee researcher, and she's just finished her PhD studying the interactions between native bees and European honeybees in urban areas of southwest and western Australia. Kit is also an author and has written a book called Creating a Haven for Native Bees, as well as an e-book called A Crash Course to Australian Bee Taxonomy and Identification. Kit is also a lover of the arts and has studied and competes in gymnastics and has also created a number of bee-related designs that she's used on t-shirts and other items. In this wonderfully informative podcast, Kit gives us so much information about native bees, like how to attract them to your garden, what makes a good bee hotel, and how to distinguish native bees from the introduced honeybee and similar looking insects like wasps and flies. I learnt so much about our native bees from my talk with Kit, and I'm sure you will as well. You'll also get to hear the five songs that Kit selected and her reasons for choosing them. Okay, Kit, thanks for joining me today. Thanks for um, wanting to talk to me about bees. Well, it's an amazing subject. I, I think a lot of people have got such an affinity towards um, insects in general, but I, I'm sh- probably butterflies and bees and dragonflies are the ones that people tend to see the most. So I wanted to get from you, what's the difference between native bees and the European honeybees that most people see? Yeah, so there's 20,000 species of bees in the world and 2,000 species of bees in Australia. So um, it's hard to say, well, there's clear native bees versus honeybees in terms of differences Um, but honeybees are very different from pretty much the majority of native bee species so this is also a problem when it comes to conservation or um, raising awareness about bee protection because they don't represent bees as a whole even though all the media attention is on the european honeybee they're actually outliers in the whole entire bee world. So the majority of our native bees are solitary. They don't live in big colonies. Um, There are a couple of um, species, 11 in Australia, um, the Melopanini that are colonial and live in that eusocial structure, but they're also stingless. So again, this idea of um, what makes a, a bee a bee based on honeybees is quite misleading. Most people then start to think that all native bees are stingless, but actually the majority can sting. They just won't sting you. So they're far less aggressive than honeybees. And the majority of bees actually don't make honey either. So this idea of bees are insects that make honey isn't correct. Again, it's only the eusocial bees. So in Australia, 11 out of about 2,000 species make honey, but the majority don't. Um, they come in a huge range of colors behaviors so there's a huge diversity in terms of that but most of them are unlike honeybees okay and and so the european honeybee is the only one that's commercial well over on east coast of australia sugar bag bees which are those stingless or melopanini bees there's a small market and it's growing so it's a small at the moment market that's growing and they Because they do live in colonies, they actually can be managed. And um, the main one is Tetragonula carbonaria. They do make honey that can be harvested, but the difference is they make only about a jar a year. So it's a very small amount. It can't sort of supply the whole entire honey market. Um, They can also be used for pollination services of crops like the honeybee and in particular used for macadamia pollination as well as a couple of other crops. But yeah, the the majority of bees also can't be um, sort of like used for commercial purposes. Okay. And I know that uh, European honeybees were introduced in Australia in the early 1800s, around 1820s, I think. Obviously, they've had a massive impact on on our native bee populations and our uh, ecosystems as a whole. Do they do some beneficial services? So this is a very, like, thorny and controversial topic. And whenever it gets raised, there's some very strong opinions on either side by the beekeepers and then, like, native um, bee conservationists. Honeybees, they are, you know, an introduced species They are a very successful species because they live in such big colonies. Because they live in colonies, they're able to communicate where good patches of flowers are and um, usurp the the foraging resources that native bees need. And they're generalists, so 
they are less like vulnerable to land clearing and other things. So they can have beneficial outcomes, but mainly from a crop pollination perspective because they're generalists, because they can be managed. They will visit exotic crops, including in landscapes that are very unsuitable for native bees, which can sort of be a bad thing for native bees indirectly because then people can go, well, we don't need to keep the large tracts of native vegetation around almonds because we can just truck in honeybees and they can do the pollination services. So even then there's an indirect negative impact. When it comes to honeybees in natural areas, then it's unlikely that they will have a beneficial impact. They can pollinate things, but we have to think, well, you know, other fauna were pollinating the flora before honeybees arrived. So it's not like they're filling a niche that wasn't there before. Um, so in national parks, in places that should be reserved for conservation, um, beekeepers are still allowed to put essentially an introduced species in high abundances into these protected areas. It's like putting livestock into national parks. It's just not something that, that should be done when areas are set aside for wildlife conservation. So yeah, honeybees, they do like, we need them for crop pollination. We need them for honey production because the native bees um, would never be able to completely fulfill the role that this abundant general species can perform. But when it comes to, um, you know, natural areas, then it's an overall like net negative impact. Okay. Is there anything that native bees do that European honeybees can't do as far as pollination or uh, other ecosystem services? Yeah, so um, one thing that honeybees can't do, and this is even for crop pollination, is they can't do what's called buzz pollination where um, there's flowers where they will only release the pollen if they're vibrated at a particular frequency. Honeybees can't do that. Um, quite a few lineages of native bees can do that. Um, one of the most effective ones are the amygdala. Um, so these are the amygdala that are sometimes called blue banded bees, sometimes called teddy bear bees. There's a, over 30 species of amygdala in Australia and they have been looked at for pollination even of tomatoes in greenhouses and they're very effective. Honeybees can't do that. We've also got native Solanaceae, which are, require, you know, the buzz pollination. So yeah, they, they can do that. And then specialized foraging relationships. So some of our native bees have co-evolved with um, flora and they're ones that honeybees won't visit. They've got like specialized adaptations for handling the flowers. So yeah, there, there are sort of like niches that native bees fill that the honeybees don't. Okay. How can people tell the difference between bees as compared to similar looking wasps or indeed large flies? You know, there's a, there's a number of flies that have various spots and, and stripes on them. Funnily enough, a couple of months ago in November, there was like an outbreak of surfid flies. Um, these are the little yellow and black flies. And because of this media tension that bees are yellow and black insects, which um, the majority of bees actually aren't yellow and black. It's that focus on honeybees. I got so many people saying, wow, there's so many native bees. And unfortunately, there were the surfed flies and native bees actually are not doing very well this season. So when it comes to flies and bees, it's actually relatively easy. Flies have one pair of wings. Bees have two pairs. Their body shape is different. Flies have really big bulgy eyes. They have short antennae that tend to come out of the middle of their, their forehead. So then with bees versus wasps, it's a bit more difficult. And this is because um, they're actually closely related. So flies are in the order Diptera. Bees and wasps are both Hymenoptera. And bees are actually a branch of wasps that evolve to um, exclusively feed on nectar and pollen. So from like a, a phylogenetic perspective, bees are wasps. Um, so they they can look very similar, especially like the Bembix wasps um, look quite similar to bees. Um, differences include um, for 
sun bees, but not all bees. Um, they have specialized pollen collecting hairs called scopae. And so, and these are located at various locations on bees' bodies. It depends on the, the genus. But if you see an insect with big you know, clumps of pollen on it, it will be a female bee. Um, if you see an insect carrying another insect as prey, it will be a wasp. So the, the female wasps, they feed on nectar, but their offspring feed on, you know, lepidoptera larvae or spiders or cockroaches. So the, the diet is one thing. And then they also move differently. So wasps tend to be like really like anxious and they're always like twitching their antennae and twitching their legs, how they hold their wings. So bees hold it their wings sort of like parallel at rest, whereas most wasps hold their wings in a bee shape. Um, yeah. And then the, the position of their eyes, like bees and their antennae. So bees tend to have oval eyes with antennae placed higher up on their forehead, whereas wasps tend to have kidney-shaped eyes and their antennae are placed lower down. So those are some of the, like the, the morphological features. Excellent. Oh, well, that's good. I'm sure people will be able to pick up uh, a lot better what, what they're seeing in the garden. I suppose the other thing is just for, for people to understand, what's the difference between nectar and honey and how does pollen fit into that whole scheme of things? Yeah, so honey is actually nectar that has had some water evaporated off it. So the water content has been reduced and some enzymes of the bee has been added into it. So it's only produced by the colonial eusocial bees as a, a, a surplus of nectar that they store and then they can um, go feed it to their offspring. With the native bees, they collect nectar and they mix it with pollen and they provision their young that way. So then the, the nectar or, you know, what we, for the eusocial bees, honey, that's providing energy um, but the pollen is the key thing that provides in particular protein um, minerals vitamins nutrients that's for the developing baby bees so the adult bees don't eat the pollen they get the, the females cl specifically collect pollen so that their offspring have those nutrients for development and and royal jelly is another term that gets bandied around how does that fit into that whole equation yeah, so royal jelly is only with the honeybees and it's really interesting because it's the thing that determines whether a baby honeybee, the larvae, becomes a queen or just becomes a worker. So genetically, there is at the, the level of the DNA sequence, there is no difference between a queen honeybee and a worker honeybee. The difference is how those genes are expressed. and that cascade of, of the genetic expression differences is that they are fed something different called um, royal jelly, which is a substance that the nurse bees regurgitate and feed to the larvae that are going to become queen honeybees. Okay. So we're going to listen to your first song now, Kit, Eyes Like Yours by Shakira. Can you tell us why you picked that song? So I have loved Shakira even before she became big in Australia. My dad, he works FIFO and sometimes worked overseas when I was growing up. And he's, a, he's an engineer and he went to, it was somewhere in South America. And that's where Shakira is from. And he, she was like a very popular singer there, like all in, um, you know, Spanish. And so he got her CD for me and I like I loved um, her and then she became big in Australia and that was great and this song um, has like even special resonance for me because I'm a gymnast and I did a gymnastics routine to this song as well and I just love the like the sort of Latin vibes and um, I think it's a, a really like cool song. So, Kip, before the song, you gave us a great introduction into like what bees are, the, the native bees in Australia, what they look like and how they differ from, from other um, small, similar insect species that might be in the garden. I want to dig a little bit more down into probably the more technical aspect of your PhD re research, which congratulations on, by the way. I, I believe it was uh, finalised about six months ago. Is that right? 
Um, so my PhD, I submitted it in August and it was um, passed in about a month ago. Um, I've got a few minor revisions to do, but the feedback from the examiners was very positive and yet yeah, passed. Um, one of them um, recommended it should be commended. So that was that was really great. Um, yeah, on, on the way to being a doctor. <laughs> Fantastic. I, I, it must be a great relief. So your PhD interactions uh, between native bees and introduced honeybees in urban areas. Can you tell us what the, like uh, in, a, in a simple summary view, what that means? Yeah, so um, it was a, a massive project and I ended up branching out into looking at many other things, but I was primarily interested, um, I guess with three main strands, all looking at um, native bees, and their interactions with plants and honeybees in the urbanised region of the Southwest Western Australian Biodiversity Hotspot. So in Perth, um, which is the capital city of WA, we're actually located in a globally recognised biodiversity hotspot, um, which makes it a really interesting place to do research because it's an urban area, but it's also in um, a place that is known to have high biodiversity, mainly in terms of the plants. Um, so I was looking at how habitat types in terms of people's gardens versus patches that that remnant bushland support native bees and looking at the flowers they visit and the networks of those interactions and then how honeybees um, influence these interactions and the native bees themselves. Okay, and, and from that you you published a paper which is quite self-explanatory really is residential gardens are a poor substitute for native bushland. Yeah, yeah. So the, the native vegetation that remains in urban areas, it's just so important for native bees. We can't replicate that with gardens, but what you do in your garden can make a difference, but it can't replace the native vegetation because that's a whole ecosystem there. And un unless you have everyone in the street planting the right plants, which are native plants, on the verge is connecting it all up. You know, you don't have that connectivity and so many people plant exotic flowers, which is just inappropriate for many of our native bees that have cobalt for the Australian flora uh, over thousands of years and they just can't survive on the exotic plants. So if, you know, this sort of ideal of, of a garden taken from, I guess, Europe as being full of a high diversity of like tulips and petunias and marigolds and pansies. That's like a desert to a native bees. Okay, so is it simply a case of people need to have more species complex in their gardens or is it they have to have more things that are native to their specific area? Yeah, so it's more about the particular plants. So you don't need to get bogged down about having ones that are local to your local area. Um, it, it can be good so that like they're better adapted to the soil, so it's less effort. But the metaceae, like the gum trees, eucalypts, they, they're like the key ones that will attract so many native bees. Yesterday, I went for a jog and um, I'm, I'm in like a very suburbia and there were some like eucalypts I don't think they're even native to like Western Australia, um, but there were literally hundreds of little specialist native bees visiting it that can only forage on eucalypts. So yeah, it's making sure that you've got like definitely have a eucalypt or um, a mel melaleuca, uh, leptosperm, those metaceae are really important. The native pea plants are great ones as well. And then, yeah, it's the species composition um, as well as the nativeness. And as I said, like local to your area is probably best um, in terms of the overall environment, but for supporting native bees, native Australians. And despite that, like people still tend to just go for like exotic plants. Hmm. And I feel like that's really, it's really weird because not only is it more hard work, like I'm I'm not a gardener. It's so funny. Like I, 
I love native bees. I am all about making sure you have good gardens for native bees, but I am not a gardener. I cannot look after plants. Um, so native plants are actually lots of them in Western Australia we have. We, we live in what's called an um, old climatically buffered infertile landscape. So the soil is terrible. It's basically sand. And if you want to grow like exotic plants, you just have to put fertilizer in and water them heaps. Um, the native plants are better adapted to those soils and, and they, they actually get killed if you put too much um, like phosphate fertilizer in. So it makes sense to go native. Is it a matter of a range of different plant types? So should we have ground covers, shrubs, trees um, to cater for bees that might be in different layers? So that is like a question that I would love to look at and I put a grant in to look at it but apparently that's not interesting enough but I think in terms of I guess like economic value but I think it's super interesting ecologically to look at the foraging preference heights of native bees um, but just based on my observations um, I do find that some bees prefer to forage close to the ground on um, sort of like brown substrates um, and other ones higher up and from again, like a whole ecosystem perspective, having a range of substrate heights is good because you can have like the birds and then the lizards on the ground. So yeah, I would definitely try and create that structural complexity as well. Yeah, cool. I know I was thinking exactly the same thing. It's it's sort of like we do it for birds, we do it for for maybe reptiles and frogs and things like that. Um, we cater to you know their different preferences for maybe nesting. Uh, ground foraging, protective cover and things like that. Would the same plants cater for like nectar feeding birds and bees? No, not usually. So um, some plant, quite a few plants have actually evolved to deter birds so that bees come or deter bees so that birds visit them. So there are some plants that are visited by birds and bees. So like, again, the eucalypts. Um, they'll be visited by parrots and bees and wasps and flies. But then there are other plants that are adapted to bird pollination. So they will have very long corollas or tubes so that only the long bird bill can get into it. And the nectar often is a different concentration to cater to the higher like energy needs of birds. And there's been like studies um, looking at kangaroo paws actually, which are bird pollinated and native bees because they're specialised, they won't go to the kangaroo paws, but honeybees will. And they found that the honeybee visitation actually is negative to the kangaroo paw because the honeybees don't forage as far. So, yeah, there's, and then you've got like flowers that the birds just won't go for because they're too small and they're just, the, the nectar isn't the right um, concentration or composition. There are some, as I said, some flowers like bottle brush as well as one that's visited by parrots and bees. Yeah, there's a, there's a huge diversity, but if you just plant for birds, you're unlikely to be able to cater to all the foraging needs of, of native bees. Okay. And I know you've written a book on this and we'll probably chat about that a little bit later, but I know if I go to a, like a, a nursery or a hardware store that sells plants, they're, they're great at putting those tags out there that say bird attracting. Should we be having bee attracting <laughs> tags on our plants as well? Yeah, we. I think we definitely should. And unfortunately, there are like things that are called pollinator mixes or bee mixes that are sold by Mr. Fothergills. And I think there's like 13 plants in there and... 11 of them are exotic plants, which aren't visited by bees. And I'm pretty sure like two of them aren't even visited by honeybees. So they've just been like, okay, cool. These look like they probably visited by bees. And yeah, it gets me really angry that there's quite a few of us that are putting ourselves out there on social media. Social media is not my favorite thing to do. I don't get paid for it, but like we're readily, readily available to advise on these. And then, yeah, they just like, swindle people's money with detriments to the wider environment which is not very good a little bit more greenwashing sort of thing mm. you spoke before about i mean a little bit more on the habitat fragmentation and urbanization but how, how far does a, a bee fly when it's typically foraging what's a home range 
So it depends on the bee species um, and it, it varies with body size. So some of our native bees are just two millimeters long and most of these are the specialist bees. So they probably can't fly more than 50 meters and that would be a big flight for that little bee. And I've been doing some studies on a critically endangered plant that's visited by bees and it's separated by probably a kilometre and it's showing inbreeding, which suggests that the bees aren't moving between the, the plants. So yeah, native bees, the small ones would have very small foraging ranges. Um, the only bees that have been in Australia who've like explicitly been measured, um, their flight distance is Tetragonula. So this is a eusocial bee. They tend to forage about 250 meters. And obviously the, cl the, the closer the plants are to the nesting resource, the less energy the bees have to use to go and find resources. So fragmentation is not a, a good thing for native bees. Okay, and, and probably begs the next question is, if like I wanted to start attracting um, the eusocial bees to my garden, where are they gonna come from? Can we bring them in, you know, from a, a local breeder or will they arrive given enough people doing the right thing? So the the solitary bees, they will be, you know, they, they will arrive from the bushland patches um, and they can even establish in your garden or around your garden if there's sufficient resources. So I've actually just um, got a paper that's been accepted for publication on a bee Leoproptus plumosus and I recorded its nesting habits in people's gardens. So it's nesting, it's a ground nesting bee and it's been nesting in their gardens, which suggests that, yeah, they, it's, they've established in, in that area. With the, uh, the eusocial Meloponini bees on the East Coast, you can actually buy a colony and put it in your yard so they don't need to travel there. You can actually keep one and, essentially keep them as pets. The other thing I was gonna talk about is uh, bee hotels. What is the essential um, requirements of a bee hotel? I've seen lots of different ones in different stores and in the local botanic gardens with a variety of, of hole sizes. Can you give people an idea of what they should be doing as far as a bee hotel is concerned? Yeah, so bee hotels have become super popular lately, um, which is good and bad because correctly designed they can be great they will encourage bees to your garden they will create extra um, nesting resources for the native bees but lots of like hardware stores are getting on the bee bandwagon and selling bee hotels that are designed very poorly and will either not attract bees or if they do can do harm so I've seen ones with holes with splinters in them so if a bee goes into it its rings wings will be ripped I've seen ones with short that the diameter and the length are really important. So if the diameter is more than about a centimetre, it's probably too big for the native bees. If the length is, um, ideally it should be at least 10 centimetres. If it's shorter, um, it can run the risk of um, skewing the sex ratio or having all the bees um, subject to parasitoid wasps. And also like not so much the ones that are sold, but sort of companies putting out massive bee hotels, but this isn't what occurs in nature. And it can, if there's disease, the disease will just spread through the like a very large population. So what companies don't even seem to recognize is bee hotels, they are replicating nesting resources in nature that occur in woody trees where holes created by wood boring beetles are used by uh, about 30% of native bees to use as nesting resources. So we're trying to replicate that with the bee hotels and they, they, they can work and um, you can have, you know, lots of native bees nesting in these, which is a great thing. Um, but yeah, getting the diameter correct is, and the, the length is, is important. Okay. And, and there's more information in, in your book uh, about that? Yeah, um, more information about that, what makes a good bee hotel, what makes a bad bee hotel, the species that will use it, as well as a big list of the best plants for the native bees. Excellent. Okay, we're going to listen to your second song now, which is Love Not War uh, by Jason Derulo. Um, what made you pick this song? 
Uh, so I love songs by Jason Derulo. Like they're just something that whenever I hear, I want to dance to. Um, and this song was released fairly recently. And I feel like it's a really positive one and um, just like a really happy, feel good song that we all need in these sort of like times. Okay, so you were born in uh, Tasmania, but you live in WA. How long have you been in WA, kid? Well, I first came to WA when I was in year one. So I think that's five or six years old. Um, my dad's work. We, well, I was born in Tasmania, then we went to Melbourne, then Wollongong and New South Wales, and then WA. We were here a couple of years and then moved to Brisbane um, again for dad's work and then moved back to WA for dad's work. And I've been in WA since, but I went back to Tasmania in, I was about to say last year, but it's now the year before, um, in October after not being back for over a decade to do some work, some B work. And it was great because I got to see my family again. And um, my paper was just recently published on the work I was doing. Yeah, it was um, Was at the Tasmanian apple orchards. Yeah, yeah, that was, um, so I did, it was part, part of a global project looking at visitors to apple orchards across different climatic regions. This paper is just based solely on the research I did there. So I did sort of, sort of an extra project where, although my main focus was recording bees to the apple blossoms, um, honeybees, bumblebees, which we, Bombus terrestris, which is an introduced species in Tasmania, as well as the native bees. But then I wanted to do it, go a step further. And I was like, are the native bees visiting the native flora or the weeds around the apple orchards? And that definitely was the case. And I found that because apple is an introduced species, the majority of visits were by honeybees and then by the bumblebees. But I recorded quite a few native bees around the orchards, especially on the native vegetation. So reinforcing that importance of native vegetation. Um, but also on the last orchard I sur surveyed, it was an integrated pest management one and the other ones were organic and it didn't have much native vegetation, which was really bad, but because it was integrated pet pest management, it had lots of weeds in the undergrowth and hardly any native bees were visiting the apple blossoms, but they were loving the weeds. So reinforcing that importance of, of other flowers in and around orchards. Yeah, yeah. I, I think you, you recorded something like 26 species in total there. Um, yeah. But the, was it 95% of the pollination of of the apple trees were done by introduced species. Yeah, yeah. And doing that research was so important because Tasmania is so understudied when it comes to native bees. So it was like this massive opportunity and I'd love to go back there because I was I was only there in October. The sort of peak bee season is um, a, a bit later, especially in Tasmania because bees like it when it's warm. And Tassie, it was... Tassie's so erratic in the mm. weather, like it'll go from like 27 degrees one day to like 10 degrees the next day. So I it was only the tip of the iceberg of the native bees that are there. Um, so really exciting to, to do research in such an understudied, understudied area and beautiful area as well. Yeah, it's, it's a beautiful, beautiful state. Okay, Australia is prone to long dry spells and I've seen honeybees drink. Do, do native bees drink or do they get enough moisture from um like other sources yeah so native bees very very rarely drink they mainly get the moisture they need from nectar because nectar is, is quite watery um there have been only a handful of observations of native bees drinking and they occur in places where there are um no like freestanding water to suggest that they it's not a requirement for them yeah, the, I mean, the honeybees definitely need water because they use it as well to regulate the temperature of their hive. So they evaporatively cool their hive. Um, so it will mainly be benefiting honeybees. Okay, so there's a lot of press around the potential catastrophic effects of loss of bees on the entire environment. Is it as bad as they say? Um, so losing honeybees from the environment would be bad for crop pollination. It would not really do anything for you know no catastrophic loss of wildlife wild flora probably benefit for the native bees 
So that's like the world isn't going to, like the whole entire ecosystem won't collapse if honeybees go extinct. But the thing is, they're not going to. Yeah. They are the, one of the last species in the world that will go extinct. Native bees, though, one of the, like the worst things is that we don't know how many of them are doing. So I just spent three hours this morning in a Zoom meeting looking to put native bees on the IUCN list based on where they occur and how that overlaps with the 2020 bushfires. Um, and that's just looking at records. Some of them haven't even been collected since like the 80s. And, you know, we, we have no sort of like population numbers. Some are known from like for specimens. Um, it's not a very good outlook. And the lack of data over, I mean, some of them we don't even know what plants they forage on. So we can't even begin to restore habitat for them if we don't know what plants they're foraging on. So it's a really like really concerning situation. And like I put in three grants to look at how the native bees have been affected by fires in Western Australia, because all the attention is in over East. And I know that the fires are, were catastrophic there, but we've also had fires um, in Western Australia and in Tasmania and funding bodies just aren't interested in knowing how native bees are impacted. There's been money going into honeybees that, and invasive species that have been impacted. And this is when we don't want to be introduced, like increasing the abundance of an introduced species. And, you know, I've been putting in grants to put up bee hotels in fire affected areas. And yeah, it's, it's actually really, really depressing. Um, like, it's great that so many people are getting interested in native bees and the words are getting out there. And like, I love my job so much that like, I can't imagine a better job, but there's also this, I guess, for, for anyone working on poorly studied, um, underappreciated species it, that are at conservation risk, the lack of data and the lack of funding is very, very depressing. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. And and how can governments and other sort of like CSIRO and other science based organisations how can, how can they what can they do more to make bees a bit more mainstream for people to to get that uh, attention and potential funding? I don't think the issue is bees not being mainstream. Like now, over the last like five years, they've become very um, like increasingly popular. Um, among the public, it's it's the funding, especially into the taxonomy um, and descriptions. Most people firstly think that we know all the bees, which we don't, and that you can just go out, collect a bee, know what it is, or even, even worse, they think that you don't need to collect bees. You can just go look at a bee and be like, yeah, it's that. It's It requires like years of looking at bees, understanding the traits, learning how to collect them, how to identify them. Then once you think you have a species that might be undescribed, and there's so many that are undescribed, putting into a phylogenetic framework, it's like a massive undertaking. And with so many species, it's almost overwhelming. But there is a project that we've been putting together. Um, lots of taxonomists, again, it needs funding. Um, there is a fund set up the Rewind Bee Foundation called Discover Bees. And the aim is to get enough funding to go out and collect, especially in poorly studied regions and using like genetic technolo technologies and pushing forward with dis discovering, describing species so we can get a handle of where they are, how many there are and which, re which bees need some dedicated um, conservation attention. What what do you attribute that um, rise in interest in native? Is it because like more publications are getting out there, or is it a social media thing that you know groups have been set up on on Facebook or whatever that people are gravitating towards and learning more themselves? I think because I didn't really know about native bees until I came up with my PhD project. Um, and then I, not long after I came up with my PhD project, I set up a Facebook group called Bees and the Burbs. And I've been very, um, very dedicated to raising awareness about native bees. And I have seen such a growing interest um, 
you know, the group has now 9.5 thousand members all across Australia as well as um, internationally. And, you know, people asking me to give talks about native fees because I didn't come from studying native fees. It's hard to make a comparison. I, I studied horses before this and, and just like wildlife in general, but I definitely feel like there has been a massive increase and I I would like to think that I helped raise that awareness because you know now I'm in my native bee bubble but I just yeah. see native bees everywhere now and before I I don't think they would they were very much under the radar okay we're going to listen to your third song now which is contact by Lalo why did you pick this one kid this is like a, a, a random one that on Spotify um a friend he was playing it and I sort of like it and played it and I was like I really like this song. Okay kids so earlier on you were chatting about the the, the size range in bees so some are like not quite two millimeters in length and the, and the larger ones can be almost was it 24 25 mil. I know you did a fair bit of work on one of the larger ones which was the Dawson's burrowing bee. Is that your favorite bee? Is it is that something you're drawn to? Um, it's hard to choose a favorite bee, but it's definitely one of my favorites. And I'm actually hoping to get um, a tattoo of it next week. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, so Amagilla dorsoni is one of our biggest bees and it's probably the first native bee I sort of became aware of when I was in it's either like one of my last years in undergrad or in my on his year and we were looking at sexual selection and alternative mating strategies. And Dawson's burrowing bee is interesting because there's two morphs of the male. There's the major males and minor males and the major males are bigger, minor males are smaller and they've got different mating tactics. So the major males, they wait on the nesting grounds for virgin females to emerge and they battle it out. They will like fight to the death right. um, to, get to mate with a newly emerged female. The smaller males, they have like no chance of winning a fight. Um, so they will wait on flowering plants for females that don't get mated and then mate with her um, when she goes to the flowers. Um, so that they have like really interesting biology and they're like really big and look amazing. And they nest in aggregations on clay pans. Um, so like thousands of bees all together. And I'd always wanted to see these bees. They only occur around um, Gascoigne Carnarvon area in Midwest Western Australia. And they're only active for like two months a year. And an amazing native bee scientist from Arizona um, who's like written books and, and like really cool papers um, was coming to Western Australia to study them. And one of his colleagues put him in touch with me because I'm like the WA bee girl um, to like see what the weather might be like. So, you know, he's coming all the way from Arizona. He doesn't want to be like time his visit um, wrong. Um, and he was only here for two weeks. Um, so I was like, you know, looking up when the bees are being recorded, what the weather would be like, the locations. And I was like, oh, this would be such a missed opportunity if I didn't go up as well. So sort of like two weeks before I was, he was going to arrive, I was like, oh, I'm going to just like plan a road trip. And so I drove up to Carnarvon and yeah, found nesting aggregations with him and for five days did some research. We were like recording the bees mating and what they were foraging on. Um, it was a really like amazing experience. Well, going back to honeybees again, obviously there's a lot of press on on colony collapse disorder and the impacts of the Varroa destructor mite. Would that might it impact on native bees? Fortunately, no. Um, so it's with most parasite host relationships, they're quite specialised um, because it's like an evolutionary arms race where each species um, has mutations that allow it to sort of outdo. The, the parasite or the host and then beneficial mutations will allow the host or the parasite to keep up. So it doesn't appear that the mite can harm native bees, especially not the solitary ones, but there are some other diseases 
of honeybees that can be transmitted from honeybees to native bees, um, not even by contact, but when they, they found that when they go to forage on flowers, they will shed um, bee viruses. And then when a bee go, a native bee goes to forage on that flower afterwards, they will pick up the viruses. Some of the viruses are specific to honeybees, other ones are able to be transmitted. Same with uh, various other like pathogenic organisms. So it, um, there is a potential for disease transmission, but varroa mite won't wipe out the native bees. Okay, uh, I'm going to listen to your fourth song now, which is uh, an old classic, uh, What's Love Got To Do With It, but a, a remake on it by Kygo with Tina Turner. Uh, can you tell us about this one? Yeah, so my mum liked the original and I love this remix. So I this one I feel has, like Tina Turner already is like very powerful in her songs and her voice and then Kygo remixed it and it's just got this like really upbeat powerful vibe to it okay earlier on we touched on the book that uh, you released which is uh, creating a, a haven for native bees i'm interested in in what people can can do in their gardens does the book cover like a, a generalist approach or is it more specific to say wa or a certain type of environment yeah it's um general so the book has been through a number of revisions when i first wrote the book it was for WA and it's now been updated to include the whole of Australia. Um, I've got uh, sort of profiles for species that use bee hotels and it says where they occur so that the, you can check whether they occur in your area. Um, and then the list, I've got a big list of flowers and the important thing is to look at the genus. Um, so many genera occur across Australia and they will cater to those native bees. And then there's general recommendations um, for how you can help native bees as well in terms of habitat management, combating climate change and actions to do that and, and general information about like the biology of the native bees. So yeah, it's Australia wide. And I've even had like, cause the, the information on what makes a good bee hotel um, is applicable to the cavity nesting bees across the world. So I've even had people in Canada purchase my book and um, the US and it was featured on a US B blog. So yeah, it's now gone global. <laughs> Fantastic. Oh, that's great. And, and where can people uh, get a copy of this? Is it available at, at bookstores or is it through yourself? Through myself. So um, unfortunately I've sold out of the hard copies. I've now like, I think I've printed by now like over 600 books and they've all sold. I am planning on doing another um, another print batch next year. But at the moment, um, never fear, it's still available as an online ebook, And that's available just by emailing me. Um, my email address is kitprendergast21 at gmail.com. Um, so that's how um, you can get a hold of it. Does it go into uh, species identification at all or, or genus identification? Um, so, it, it lists some um, genera and bees and some general characteristics, but then I have another online ebook um, called A Crash Course in Native Bee Taxonomy. And that goes into depth of how to ID bees, um, the genera, also how to ID them from wasps and flies um, and the diagnostic details. And that sort of, um, I wasn't planning on creating that ebook, but I did a, a course for people on how to ID bees. And then after the course, people were like, we would love this as like a an ebook. And so yeah, it's now available. Excellent. Oh, fantastic. Also, uh, is something related to bees, but also a, a different area. You've got a bit of a passion for for clothing design. Uh, when I look at some of your posts on on LinkedIn and things like that. Uh, I'm always, I, I love looking at the different outfits you're wearing and things like that, but do you design all those yourselves? Are you, have, you, have you got a passion for clothing design? Um, yeah, so I love art as well. So I've got, science is my first love, but I also have a passion for the arts, visual arts, performing arts, especially performing arts. And I, I also have a passion for destroying misinformation and so when you're on Facebook like if they have targeted ads and I kept seeing this plant bees save the bees like murals 
and they had flowers for bees. I was like, they're the wrong flowers for Australian bees. So I then designed a mural with, um, I drew the some of the best flowers for native bees and some little native bees and created that mural and said plant these save the native bees. So, um, and then I created a red bubble store, um, the Bee Bay Bet. And I've now done quite a few other designs of various native bee species to raise the profile of native bees. Like red bubble has like not just t-shirts, but like if you want a, a mug with native bees on them, you can do that. Like even a bath mat. Um, yeah. Fantastic. And, and, and Costa off the ABC Gardening Show wore one of your t-shirts. Yeah, so he's he's got two of my T-shirts and he's worn them quite a fair bit. I think he even wore them on like his Christmas Day um, segment. So I'm really pleased with that. And Costa is like such a great public speaker and advocate for you know, good gardens. So that was really great. Um, I've actually featured on Gardening Australia, um, but cost not with Costa because he's over on the east coast mm. um but I did a little segment for Gardening Australia um at Kings Park here which was really fun oh awesome okay we're gonna listen to your last song uh which is Far Away From Home by Sam Felt what make you choose this one I think it's just it's such a beautiful song and like whenever I'm like driving and it comes on I turn it up sort of first heard it I guess during like sort of COVID times and I thought it was like really resonated me like even when people are far away from each other and they can't like be together and connect you know you, they're still you know in your heart I guess. So kid what what research projects are you, you're working on now what what's next for you? At the moment I'm not technically employed which is <laughs> bad but mm -hmm. I seem to be working on more things than ever in terms of like actual paid work that I'm doing. I'm doing some surveys for Department of Biodiversity Conservation and Attractions. I'm serving some reserves in the Jarrah Forest area. I've also was pre previously doing some surveys for them at a reserve to find um, a threatened bee and I couldn't find it. I found lots of other bees, um, but yeah, this is the case. Like it hadn't been recorded for over a decade. Um, the outlook is not very good for it, unfortunately. But from those surveys, I've also got lots of bees um, that I need to um, curate an ID. So I've got a massive backlog in IDs to do. I'm working on yeah, getting bees listed on the IUCN Red List and hopefully the EPBC Act, EPBCA Act so that they have some legislation. I'm working on a review on looking at studies on the impact of fire and bees. I'm, and this is, this is now the non-paid work. And I'm also editing another review with a postdoc student over East, um, looking at threats to native bees. Um, I was helping her with a paper that she did on bee behavior. I'm working on getting one of my papers from my PhD published. I've got some other half finished papers that didn't make it into my thesis that I would be devastated if they never saw the light of day. So I was looking at bee hotels, pollen analysis of native bees and some um, caged experiments. And I I'm sure I've forgotten some other things <laughs> but there's so many and um the last two weeks I've been um doing fringe performances as well that's that's non b related um yeah wow like, that's that's a massive list and yeah definitely you you wouldn't yeah I don't know how you have time to to stop and talk to people like me <laughs> But no, it's been absolutely fantastic. I've learned so much and hopefully the people listening have learned so much about our native bees and, and related fauna. And I really hope that a lot of people jump on and download your ebook and and start setting up their gardens and their local areas to be more native bee friendly. Yeah, that would be wonderful. And your research is, yeah, just incredible. It's, it's people like you that really make a massive difference. So... I'm, I'm thankful that you took the time to, to chat to us about it. 
Well, thanks so much. I really appreciate um, your interest in, in the native bees and getting the word out there.